So we, we want to pose a question, really, pose a question to ourselves and, I guess, pose a question to you. And that is this, and it's very simple. Is there a case for shared digitisation? Because we feel this is something we should probably be thinking about as a community. We, we undertook a, a small trial, and we're going to present that sort of evidence, really, from that to you. We're going to go through this quite quickly, so I'll apologise in advance. So it's eight Ps we're going to talk about. So, so apologies if we're a bit flustered. These... Who knows what's happened to our slides? They were fine earlier. So there's the problem. What are we actually trying to, or what could we solve with shared digitization? What's the proposition, the partners, the pilot, the process, the product, the potential, and a related project with that? Now, quite often you'll wake up, you'll listen to the seven o'clock news in the morning, and there'll be scientists have just discovered, and you'll go, yeah, yeah, I realized that. You know, it's like, it, it, it's obvious, you know, why, why did you have to do a study that tells us that? And so we'll apologise up front, because a lot of what we're probably going to tell you, you'll go, yeah, yeah, we probably could have guessed that, you know, it's sort of obvious. So unfortunately, our text is missing, but some of what you, you'll hear are, you know, there's issues with rights, surprise, surprise, standards, licences, quality, interoperability, the state of our metadata, these are things that are going to get in our way. And so I'll apologise now, if we bring these up later on, you'll go, yeah, could have guessed that, you know, did you not think that would be the case? But really, we wanted to undertake a pilot just to actually tease out to what extent these things really are problems um, or not. So the problem, to pose it, we want to say many research libraries are now starting to undertake mass digitization. That's the position that we claim we're in. In case you wonder what we define as mass digitization, we've simply tried to define it sort of quite simply, almost a bit like big data. So big data is that next step a little bit ahead of your current comfort zone. It's that thing that worries you a bit. So we're saying for mass digitization, it might be if you do no digitization now, just having a full-time camera with one operator, that's mass digitization for you. If you then currently have that and you're thinking, well, how do we now go to three or five cameras working five days a week, that's mass digitization for you. Us at the National Library, we're now running our cameras two shifts a day, seven o'clock in the morning till nine o'clock at night. That was our next big shift that really sort of made us change the way we think about digitization, change the way we run it. So don't worry, mass digitization, you don't have to walk out the room now if you go, well, I've only got four cameras, that's not mass digitization. You know, it's, it's all relative for, for us. So three, three examples of how we're doing mass digitization now. You know, National Library of Scotland, we've got our strategic aim we're working towards in 2025 of having a third of our collections in digital format. So for example, this year we're now on track to digitize 200,000 items um, across three digitization centers. University of Edinburgh, they finished last year 17,000 PhD theses. They're currently 100,000 pages through their session papers project. Um, Trinity, they've been, they have a new strategic aim of opening up the analog legacy collections for global access through large scale digitization. This is their um, robotic scanner that sits there all day long um, digitizing automatically. So, so that, that, that's some examples from three different libraries. So the problem then, or the hypothesis, I suppose, that we're putting out there is if there is an increase in mass digitization, will there be some level of duplication in that digitization? And if we therefore assume that duplication is wasteful, um, or muda, as you'd call it into the Japanese if you, you're into your lean methodologies and things like that, then if we share that digitization and reduce the duplication, which outweighs which? The savings that we make for reducing the duplication versus the cost of coordination. And that's sort of what we'll look at really with this presentation. Or to put it another way, simply can, with our shared digitization, can we save resources by working together? And so we thought we'll have a pilot to test that. So we very carefully scoured the landscape of all the RLUK members and picked three top class institutions. Simply because we're three ex-colleagues, there was nothing more scientific <laughs> than that. <laughs> so Laura Shanahan, who used to be um, at the University of Edinburgh, now at Trinity. Myself, who used to be at Edinburgh, is now at National Library of Scotland. Um, and yeah, our colleagues at the University of Edinburgh. So we thought, we'll get together um, and we'll do this pilot. You know, with a bunch of friends, we could work together, we can make things happen quite quickly. So we have two legal deposit libraries and two university libraries. And that will sort of play into this a little bit later when you sort of see how we undertook some things. Right, I'll talk about the next three Ps, the pilot, the, um, the process, and the product, or the results. In setting up the pilot, we decided that it would have to be both um, achievable and meaningful. To make it achievable, we settled on a um, sample size of 100 items, that seems reasonable enough, and um, we would select those items from our older general collections. 
Um, this way, we were hoping to sidestep thorny issues of copyright, as well as um, distractions of copy-specific details. To make it meaningful, um, we thought the, um, the sample would have to be fairly randomly selected, um, so that we could generalize from the results. Um, and we would have to agree on what duplication means, and we settled on the addition level. And finally, we had to agree on certain standards um, that are acceptable to the three of us for when it comes to imaging the materials and then sharing the digital files. <clears throat> Our approach was uh, very much um, uh, jumping right in and doing sort of, um, uh, uh, learning by, by doing, um, rather than um, trying to uh, plan everything out uh, in advance in, in, in um, minutiae detail. We, we set, um, for, for in order to generate our pool um, of items, we set two very simple criteria. Um, one is that the items would have to be published in the year 1919, so that's a kind of a neat 100 years. Um, and the other is that the, um, the word war would have to appear in the title, so that's a reference to the recent centenaries of the First World War. We were um, hoping that um, the COPAC collection management tool would um, help us with this. And um, as it turned out, it could, but there was a, a little, little snag that I'll come to now. Um, the great thing about COPAC is that um, it allowed us to select the three holding libraries. It allowed us to do a keyword search on the title, so that was great. Um, and it um, allowed us to do um, the uh, very precise calibration of um, the level of deduplication that we needed. So that was great as well. What wasn't great is that we couldn't um, limit the search to the year of publication. In fact, you can't apply any other limits um, to your result sets. So um, those um, friends uh, who are working on the NBK, um, please take note. <laughs> um, Right, so what we had to do, quite simply then, we got a result set of over 60,000 records, export those to Excel, um, extract the publication year, um, hone in on those um, 1919 publications that gave us a list of 405 items. We sorted them by the COPAC ID number, uh, and, that, um, uh, and then we simply took the first 100 um, items. And, and there we had our fairly randomly selected sample set. Um, Right, so uh, in a very quick, um, yeah, in a fairly quick um, time, um, as I said, it was, it's learning by doing, jumping in, doing it quick and dirty. Um, we had um, a report on our holdings and um, overlaps, or did we? Because as um, all of you here know, COPAC is only as good um, as the data that we feed it. <laughs> so um, we um, decided to do um, a very thorough check of um, our catalogs, um, our shelves, and um, then of the precise metadata. In, in Trinity, we decided to actually collect all of the items that we, that we found, um, have them in one space for the duration of the pilot. So if we needed to check something quickly, we could. And sort of, that's sort of a, a work in progress image. Um, right, so um, we, we had our list of 100 titles, um, each of us had to check the full list in terms of our holdings, and then we kind of did it in thirds in terms of um, providing detailed metadata so that we could be sure that we are actually having the same edition. Um, and then finally, I think initially nearly as an afterthought, we decided, oh, let's check um, what else has been, so which items of these um, hundreds have been digitized already and is freely available out there. Um, and um, so, again, that was a matter then of um, dividing up the 100 items into thirds, and we, we, we checked 33, 34, 34 each. Um, and um, that was a, a very significant step. In retrospect, of course, you we would start with that check before we did anything else. <laughs> and um, Stuart is going to talk more about the significance of that. When it comes to digitization, um, uh, we, we really kind of did the minimal approach. Um, we um, honed in on three items that um, each of us had a holding um, of, and um, so um, each library digitized one book, um, and so we had three uh, in total. Um, standards, 400 dots per inch, TIFF, we share the master files by email, um, and then we, wouldn't, we, we didn't kind of specify what each library would have to do with those three files, whether we'd put them in our repositories or not. As it, as it happens, we, each of us, we published them, um, we, we published our own um, through our repositories. 
so far. Um, this is the increase of rent and mortgage interest, War Restrictions Act 1915. Um, and um, the next is progress of aviation in the war period, some items of technical and scientific interest. And finally, the Hill of Vision by Frederick Bly Bond. Now, remember I said we wanted to avoid copyright issues. Well, um, this um, item um, has um, probably three authors um, who dabbled in automatic writing. Uh, those of you who don't know what automatic writing is, this is it. Um, it's um, channeling spirit communications. <laughs> so, two of those authors, we have a death date, which um, you know is, is luckily sort of far enough that we are out of copyright. One of them we are not sure, so um, we'd have to um, possibly register this in the Orphan Works um, Registry. Yeah. So um, what does the overlap look like? So I finally come around to giving you some results. <laughs> um, luckily, again, um, this nice uh, Venn diagram does display. And surprise, surprise, with general um, collections, the legal deposit libraries predominate. And more than half of the items were shared between them. Interestingly, if you delve down into the, um, into the overlap, um, you can see that um, the university libraries have a slightly bigger overlap than the two libraries in Edinburgh. So it's only 5%, five items, so it's a small sample, so we can't generalize from that yet, but it's uh, something to note. But the point here is, of course, that we have significant overlap. Um, over two-thirds of the 100 items are shared by at least two libraries. Um, so therefore, if we were to um, create a big um, mass digitization project with these kind of materials, um, yes, there will be duplication and there will be um, potential waste. So at this point, I'll hand over to Stuart. Yeah. And then the next question we wanted to ask about that is actually, so we know of our 100 items, how many of these have actually been digitized already somewhere else that we haven't digitized? Because we could say, in a sense, that would be another measure of waste, because we don't want to digitise something if it's already open digital elsewhere. So the number for that one actually surprised us, again, quite high. So it was 59% of those items had already been digitised somewhere else. Um, when you cut down how many of those are digitised and open, it comes down a little bit, so it's only 36%. But actually, you know, over a third of what we could have digitised is already out there openly. Um, so we don't need to, we don't need to digitise those. We only checked three sources, Hattie Trust, Internet Archive and Google Books. And we sort of say further here because if we found it in one, we didn't bother um, checking the others. So the conclusion, again, from that is if we were to do much more sort of mass digitisation of general collections, then there will be overlap. So really, we should be checking um, what's out there already. And then, I suppose, a supplementary question for us then as librarians and with our own collections, our own catalogues, should we or do we link to these externally digitised resources to our sort of physical collections? You know, they're not our copies that have been digitised, but it's pretty much the same thing. So should we, should we point people to them? And if we do... Do we, ha do we sort of say, well, we trust some sources more than we trust others? Hattie Trust, that's great, we trust them. Google Books, mm, don't trust them, maybe. But actually, most of what's in Hattie Trust came from Google Books anyway, so should we just um, put all these links in? So that's something I think we need to think through. So we'll, we'll speed up a little bit, I think. But the cost savings of this, surprise, surprise, when you're just digitizing 100 books, or in our case, just the first three to start with, the cost of that, you know, we put 33 days into the project and we got three books out. That's not efficient. We're not going to do that again, don't worry. So there's no, there's no cost savings there. So we thought, well, let's actually extrapolate this. At what point does it become, if, if it does, does it become um, worth sharing digitization? So if we were to go back next week and finish this project with 100 books, we, we reckon it goes up to about 51 days, that's 17 days per partner. Um, so actually now the cost comes down to, so we, we calculate all this in FTEs rather than sort of pounds and pence or euros, but um, we're saying it's more like 0.17 days of a person um, to get each book. So actually we're starting to get down to values which, which do save us money. So we thought we'll extrapolate this. What, what would happen if everyone in this room were to collaborate? So we get 30 members, we get 10,000 books. What does that then look like? So if we assume, you know, again, we're only doing two thirds of these, if a third of them are already digitized, we put in about a month each of um, administration, we put in maybe two FTE sort of central coordination to actually make this happen. Um, the metadata we put in, we reckon about 3000 days for everybody to check their holdings. Um, digitization, four books a day, 1600 days. 
Again, it, it adds up quite a lot. So you're looking at well over 5,000 days worth of effort to do 10,000 books. So you're looking at about half a day per book. So that isn't, again, necessarily efficient. We can digitize better than half a book, a book every half day. However, you split that up per partner and essentially what they're contributing, we're down to like two or three pounds per book. So if we were to work together for less than the cost of one FTE for one year, you would get 10,000 books digitized from your collection back given the overlap and what you have. So when you're working at that sort of scale, it does, the numbers sort of do add up. So the conclusion from that is obviously, and this is one of those duh, surprise, you know, collaboration actually costs money. You know, it'll probably in a sense double the cost of actually digitizing each book, but you split that up over a large number of partners and actually then the, the unit cost does become much, much cheaper and probably worth looking at. However, one of the things you're probably thinking is, but aren't, you know, actually a lot of what we're digitizing right now is, is our unique collections, really, not our general collections. And if it's our unique collections, that duplication doesn't happen. So, um, you know, one of the things is, 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 is that the case? Are we really just choosing unique collections? Or, um, or at what point will we start moving into more general collections? So, yeah, what have we learned or, or confirmed throughout the way you, uh, along the project? You know, it is things like licensing that gets in the way. We agreed up front how to crop our images, but all three teams cropped them differently, things like this. Um, how do we do project management and coordination? Um, as, as Christoph said, there was a lot of problems with COPAC data, um, or indeed our own data that then matches with COPAC. So if you just look at the false negatives here, so this was where COPAC said we don't have things, but actually we do have them. 20% of Trinity's um, results were false negative. They actually have those items, but COPAC's not representing it. 10% um, with us at National Library of Scotland and so forth. And actually our catalogers, when they looked at it, they said, this is awful. And they actually went back and recatalogued all 100 items, um, simply because they said, you know, <laughs> we can't leave it like this. It's, it's not good enough. So one of the things I suppose just to leave you with, to think through, well, as a community, is there something we should be doing here? And if so, you know, what are the different things we could be thinking about? So number one is actually let's do nothing. You know, what we're digitizing right now, it tends to be unique collections. So let's just leave it at that. That's fine. Number two, should we actually say, well, if nothing else, could we do some sort of tracking and monitoring of who's planning digitization, what's underway, what they've completed? Because we don't really share that. So at the National Library of Scotland, we've got a big sort of multi-year selection um, plan now. None of you have probably ever seen that, and, and you know, should we share all those sort of more routinely? Number three, could we, should we undertake a much larger trial, you know, actually say, well, let's do this at the RLUK level and see whether, you know, whether it works, whether it adds value to us. Number four, could we just go the whole hog, have sort of a big bit of vision? So we almost set up sort of the UK equivalent of Hattie Trust, um, and that actually then brings whole new options as well, because you're saying, well, actually, we can have a central body that coordinates this, stores it once, preserves it once, that sort of thing. Um, or there are, are there other options? So this is sort of, in a sense, what we'd be interested to hear from you. And as it says here, if you're stuck for a topic at dinner tonight, you don't know who you're sat next to and you want something to talk about, well, talk about this and sort of let us know what you come up with. So, two slides just to finish off with. You're probably wondering, which is what it says in that gap, but it's not there. You're probably wondering, wouldn't it be great if there was a single global register of all digital texts? Because ignoring the fact you're librarians, if you just want to know, you're at home, you want to know, has this book been digitized? You can search Google, you can search Internet Archive, Hattie Trust, but at some point, an hour later, you have to give up because it's just like, well, I can't find it anywhere. But it doesn't mean it hasn't been done. So would it be good if that such a thing existed? You know, it would help us in terms of our digitization selection, looking for duplication, could help anyone to find um, open books. And then, you know, for example, there's digital scholarship benefits. Wouldn't it be great if you could just take a big sort of cross section from a particular subject, of all open digitized books, download them automatically, do your work with them. So we thought that. Um, we've, we've formed a partnership, which has been really good. So National Library of Scotland, Wales, British Library, Hattie Trust in the US, uh, universities Glasgow as academic partners, um, the Information Studies Department and RLUK are a member of this as well, so Matt's sort of representing that. We've won some AHRC funding to investigate this, um, so we put that in as part of their research networking collaboration call, which was out in um, autumn last year. And we've been funded to do this project, so looking at developing a global data set of digitized text. So the purpose of that being to explore the feasibility of a global registry of digitized works and the value that such a registry could bring to digital scholarship and libraries. So this will be taking place over the next um, 12 months. We've got four workshops, two in the US, two in the UK. I think one will be at the British Library 20 
21st of June. Um, that'll be the first UK one. And we're, we're basically going to look at sort of, is this feasible? Can we take the Hattie Trust, who obviously in a sense, they have this data for North America. Could we sort of merge in some of the large UK library databases and just sort of see, you know, is this a feasible, is it a tractable problem? Um, and we're, all, we're almost sort of looking at it as a planning grant, basically, you know, could we do this? Because if, if the conclusion is, yes, it could be done, then actually that's a much, much bigger project. So we're not actually going to do it. We're just looking at, at the feasibility of it. So that's the end. Um, so really, I suppose we leave you with that question. We've, we've presented a trial, a small-scale trial, some evidence, and then is that sort of that's the question. Is there a case for shared digitization, and what should we, you know, what should RLUK do about that? Thank you. Thank you.